I remember years ago hearing Pastor uh, Chuck Swindoll say marriage is like flies on a screen door. Those on the inside are dying to get out and those on the outside are dying to get in. Uh, yesterday, I, I felt really bad for one of my subscribers uh, wrote in and said that uh, in a comment that she felt useless because um, she's single. And uh, so I, I prayed about it and I kind of reflected on things. And I just want to share some lessons that I learned from the woman at the well. And it's lessons for us married folks as well, but even more so for the single Christians out there. Um, first, I want to say this, you know, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, I believe it's like maybe verse 31 or 32, he says he wants us all to be free from anxiety. He doesn't want us to be anxious. And so he gives us advice. He said the married man is anxious. <laughs> the married woman is anxious because we're trying to please our spouse and we're trying to please the Lord. We're, we're divided. And then he goes on to give the analogy of a soldier in a war. You can't be thinking about home. Are you going to put your life? You know, I had Dale Comstock on the show, uh, a war hero, uh, 20 years, a Delta Force operator, mercenary, Green Beret, CIA, black ops dude. And he says, you know, if you if if you are thinking about anything but the fight you're in, that split second could kill you, you know? And he's been in life and death situations more than once, so he would know. But St. Paul describes it as a soldier. Yes, you know, marriage is a sacrament. The Catholic Church holds marriage in a higher view than any other church. You know, I was Protestant for 30 years and, and we respected marriage and, and we thought very highly of marriage, but nothing like the Catholic Church as it's a holy sacrament that we actually receive grace from. So sometimes people feel if they're single, they can't be used. So I want to address that. St. Paul said he chooses to stay single because he can do more for the Lord. And you can do a lot for the Lord as a married person, but your first priority is your wife and kids. You know, that's your, you know, that's the domestic church. That's your main focus. But as a single person, you're free to serve the Lord. So don't, don't look at yourself as useless, you know. You know, Jesus said that the Father sent him into, world, into the world to save the world, not to condemn the world. John three seventeen. You know, and you know, some people feel worthless because maybe they had a bad parent that made them feel worthless. But the perfect parent, our Father in heaven, says you are worth the blood of God. There's no higher worth. So receive that. You know, we're not worthy of that. All of us are sinners. But to God, we're worth his son's blood. God, the son's blood. So that's a high word. So first get that, you know, make that become real. And then no, you know, like I said, St. Paul in, in Corinthians talks about being single. You can do so much more for the Lord because you're not, your allegiance isn't uh, divided. You know, you're all sold out for Jesus 100%. And, you know, the story about the woman at the well, the woman at the well, you know, Jesus had just uh, baptized a ton of people. You know, this is uh, chapter four is the woman at the well. Chapter three is when he has the meeting with Nicodemus says, and, and he tells him, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. Unless you're born of water and the spirit, you can't be born again. And chronologically, in another gospel, if you read the Bible chronologically, it's clear what he's talking about because Jesus was baptized in water and the Holy Spirit came on him in the form of the dove, water and spirit. This is what he's talking about. This is why for like 17, 1800 years, every Christian believed when you were baptized, you were born again. You know, this is why St. Peter said in Acts chapter two, repent and be baptized. This is why Peter says in first Peter three twenty one, you know, Noah was saved by the water now baptism saves you so it's obvious once i learned you know i used to think if you just walk up and confess jesus as lord um you're born again but once i learned how to read the bible exegetically and um in context i realized jesus was talking about baptism that's when you're born again of course you got to confess the lord but in before you're baptized you confess that jesus is lord and you reject satan and you reject sin you know if you have a proper baptism you say all these things and um, 
And then it says Jesus went on baptizing multitudes, but not him, his apostles. And then he got wearied. They were baptizing so many people that he was wearied and tired. And he went to a well for the, a drink. And the time frame is sometimes about noon. And the women would always go before the sun come up. And there was chit chat and talk about, you know, they, they were, um, there was camaraderie amongst the women. But Jesus went there at noon in the heat of the day. And there was a woman there. So apparently she was there because she was not part of the cool crew. She was an outcast. She was a sinner. And um, Jesus just had a theological discussion with a very bright man, a, a, a Pharisee, Nicodemus. And then he's having a conversation with just this lowly woman who, you know, back then, you know, women were like second class citizens. And turns out she's a Samaritan woman. So Jews wouldn't talk to Samaritans. And any good Jew wouldn't talk to a woman if it wasn't his wife either. So here he is, Jesus, you know, scandalizing everybody by talking to a Samaritan woman and actually having a theological conversation. Actually, she gave him a more intelligent conversation than Nicodemus did. And then he reveals to her that he's the Messiah. The first person he told. He chooses her. Why didn't he tell Nicodemus? He kind of alluded to it, but Nicodemus wasn't catching it. But he told her straight up, I am he. When she said, you know, the Messiah is coming. He's like, you're looking at him. This is the guy you're talking to. I'm him. I'm the Messiah. And, you know, before that, he asked her where her husband was. And she says, I'm not married. And he says, oh, you tell the truth because you've been married five times. And the guy you're shacking up with now ain't your husband. So basically, she was. this is why she was there alone. She was considered a, a whore. You know, married five times, divorced five times. Oh, what scandal. What kind of person is that? Well, that was the kind of person Jesus came for, <laughs> you know? So no matter what your condition is, Jesus came for you. He's talking to a sinner. And he chooses her to reveal that he's the Messiah, you know? And you're like, well, why didn't, you know, chapter three, why didn't he tell the Pharisee that? Well, you know, even though Nicodemus was one of the better Pharisees. He seemed humble. He still came at night. He still wasn't, he was still kind of like, didn't want people to know he was talking to this Jesus guy. Uh, and Jesus told a parable about a Pharisee in a temple, you know, praying, Lord, I thank you that I'm such a good, I'm such a godly man. I'm such a good, holy man. I tithe and I dress properly, you know, and, and I, and I do everything right not like this sinner tax collector over here. And he looks at this wretched sinner tax collector. And Jesus says, the tax collector was so ashamed of his sin, he wouldn't even look up and said, Lord, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, whose prayer do you think God heard? He heard the sinner's prayer. And this is why chapter three, he's talking to a Pharisee. You don't tell him he's the Messiah. Chapter four, he's talking to a sinful Samaritan woman and he tells her he's the Messiah. Now it says, once she heard that, she left her water jugs. And theologians say the significance of that is her water jugs is things of this world. She left the things of this world behind. So the lesson we can learn is when you have a real encounter with Jesus, you won't need any man because we know she didn't need anything of this world. All she needed to know that Jesus was God and God loves her. And she realized that. And then not only was she the first person in the Bible that it was revealed to that she was Messiah, she became the first mission to, missionary in, in the Christian church, the first missionary and evangelist. It says she ran and told everybody in the town, this man told me everything I know, surely he's the Messiah. And it says they came and they said, we believe because of what you said. Now we believe because we've encountered him. We met him. We had a real encounter with Jesus. But the story doesn't end there because church history tells us that the apostles baptized her. And when you are baptized, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And you see at the day of Pentecost, the change it made with the apostles. Yesterday was Pentecost Sunday. We celebrate the feast of Pentecost as Catholics. And think about Peter before Pentecost when a little girl said, aren't you one of the followers of Jesus? He denied him. He denied him three times because he was scared. Even though he loved Jesus, he encountered Jesus, but he didn't have the Holy Spirit power. Well, the woman at the well, when she was baptized, she got the Holy Spirit. And they said she went on and evangelized so much that she was called 
equal to the apostles. She, obviously, she wasn't equal in her authority. She was equal in her evangelistic outreach. She evangelized so many people. And she, in a dream, Jesus told her to go to Rome. And she knew that would be her death. But she wasn't afraid because she had that Holy Spirit power. So she went to Rome. And in Rome, Nero was torturing, brutally killing Christians just for being Christians. And when he heard about her winning so many pagans to the Lord and converting them, uh, he was angry. So instead of, instead of uh, the woman at the well, who is now going by her baptismal name, when they baptized her, they gave her the name Fatini, which means the enlightened one. Now Fatini didn't wait for Nero to come to her. She felt led to go to him and tell him about the Lord. And Nero beat her, tortured her, and she wouldn't deny Christ. So Nero thought of something else. He got his daughter to bring her into a room full of perfume, had, had maid servants put perfume on her and, and oils that smelled really good and showed her all diamond rings and gold and silver and said, my father said this can all be yours if you would just deny Christ. When Fatini and um, his daughter came out, his daughter said, Dad, I'm a Christian now. <laughs> Fatini converted his daughter. So a lesson, if you were following Christ and you were sold out for Christ, the devil will try and get you to deny him through suffering and pain like he did Fatini. And also he'll tempt you like, oh man, you could have all this. All you got to do is show a little skin. All you got to do is flirt a little bit. And I can give you all these riches. All you got to do is cheat a little bit. And you could have all this. All you got to do is lie a little bit. And you could have all these riches. But let's be like Fatini and say, no, convert those that are trying to tempt us. Because <laughs> the devil will use people to, to tempt us and stand firm. And then Nero got so angry that she converted his daughter that he beat her and he threw her into a deep well to die. And what the devil meant for evil, God meant for good because there is nothing more than Fatini wanted was to be with her savior, Jesus Christ, the love of her life, the number one man in her life that transformed her from a woman that was mistreated, abused, and divorced like she was a dog to being a princess of the king. So the place that she met Jesus for the first time was the place she went to spend eternally with Jesus. So another lesson we can learn from the woman at the well is what the devil means for evil, God always uses for good. And that woman went on to be called Saint Fatini. So if you're struggling with singleness that you think you're useless, ask Saint Fatini to pray for you, to show you what the Lord would have you do. If you're struggling with temptation, ask Saint Fatini to pray for you that you will overcome it. But if you've just been going through the motions, you know, the Catholic Church teaches without faith, the sacraments or void. So, you know, we're given by grace, the Holy Spirit at our baptism, but then we have to confirm it at confirmation when we're old enough to reject Satan again and repeat our baptismal prayer. But if you just went through the motions at that time, maybe the Holy Spirit never got stirred up in you. Maybe it's just sitting dormant. And it's like, I like to quote Peter Crift. It's, it would be like, you know, whole milk and you pour in chocolate syrup and it sits at the bottom but if you stir it up with a spoon it flavors the entire cup and colors it and that's what the new testament calls the baptism of the holy spirit just ask the lord baptize me anew with your holy spirit stir up the holy spirit you gave me at my baptism stir it up give me the gifts of the holy spirit so i can use the fruits of the holy spirit and i can love it's Pentecost Sunday was yesterday. Ask the Lord to give you a new Pentecost. 
The Holy Spirit is real. His gifts are real. The fruit of the Spirit are real. Study the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Study the fruits of the Holy Spirit. These are real. You know, the Holy Spirit changes you from the inside out. You know, every other religion, you follow rules, this and that. And they wonder why they never change. No, 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 no. Christianity, the Holy Spirit comes in and he changes you. He writes the, the law on your heart. So it becomes natural to you. The Holy Spirit gives you the fruits. You can't, you can't practice the fruits. I mean, you can practice virtue, but the fruits of the Holy Spirit are a gift. They come naturally when you're abiding in Christ. And as Catholics, we have the privilege of eating Jesus' flesh and blood every day. Get to Mass as often as you can. If you can go to daily Mass, go there. Because Jesus said, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, I will abide in you and you will abide in me. He loves us so much. Not only did he give us his Holy Spirit, but he gave us his flesh and blood. If I knew this as a Protestant, I would have ran to a Catholic church. Now I'm a Catholic and I try and get it as often as I can. So just know you are loved by Jesus Christ. You are loved by God. And the Bible says God is love. And once you receive his love, you can give his love. And the greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. So out of all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, out of all the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the greatest fruit is love. Ask Jesus to fill your heart with his love so you can go and love. And then if it's God's will that you meet a man, you'll meet someone on the same page as you. But you know, it's not always easy. Before St. Peter was martyred, you know, when he had the Holy, before he had the Holy Spirit, he denied Christ three times. After the Holy Spirit, he preached and was beaten, and he still came out, was preached, he was beaten, he was threatened to be killed, and he still preached. And then they said, we're going to crucify you. And he said, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. So they crucified him upside down. But before that, they crucified his wife. And he cried out to his wife, remember the Lord. He encouraged her in her martyrdom. That's not easy. You know, when you're married again, imagine watching your wife being killed. But that was St. Peter's experience. This is church history. So God bless, stay Catholic, and ask for the Holy Spirit to stir things up today and expect a miracle.